All right, all right, all right. We're finally ready to take our assets, drag them into the world, place them appropriately, and... What? That looks terrible. The moss doesn't line up. The landscape's the wrong color. There's only one thing left to do. Whew. That was a close one, guys. Much better. Hey guys, this is the last complicated episode before it starts to get fun. My wife always says to our daughter, we do what we have to do so that we do what we want to do. And that's pretty much our situation here. If you've been following along with this series, by the end of this episode, you will be completely ready to start decorating your landscape. Today, we're diving into what are called runtime virtual textures. The idea is that we have actors like this rock here in our landscape, and they don't exactly look like they go together. So can we communicate to our actors, our static meshes, what the landscape looks like in a particular location so that we can simulate, i.e. virtualize the texture of our landscape on some part of that mesh? By the end of this episode, that's what we're going to have set up, and you're going to know how to do this for any asset that you bring in from the Megascans library. We're building on our setup from last episode's landscape material, and we're doing a lot of the same kind of stuff. Working in the material editor, creating a material function for this virtual texture blend, but today we're also going to work closely with what are called material instances, the child materials, that come with each asset that you download from the Megascans library. And lastly, this episode is kind of tricky, so I'm going to walk through some of the common mistakes, including one with our landscape material that, quite frankly, I should have figured out last episode, but we'll correct it this episode. There's a lot of things above and beyond this video that virtual texturing can accomplish. So for example, making our landscape appear damp if it's close by a river. And a good place to start understanding this in more detail is a video that Unreal Engine put out a while ago. And this slide that you see here is directly from that demonstration. So check out the link below. And before we jump into it, I wanna give a big shout out to Unreal Sensei, whose video on virtual textures is also linked in the description below. His tutorial video is really the backbone of this video. So if you want more practice setting this up, check it out. Here are the key concepts for our video today. Some of this you're already familiar with from the last episode, but the Fresnel, and I had to look up the pronunciation of that one to be honest, is related to an issue with our landscape that we're gonna fix in this episode. And collision, simple and complex, same thing. So let's get to it. All right, so in our last episode, we finished our landscape painting here. And in this episode, we're gonna start bringing in assets, 3D static meshes into our world here. And we need at least one asset from the Megascans library to follow along. So feel free to navigate to our add content here and we're gonna go into Quixel Bridge, just like we've done for the past couple of episodes. But this time, instead of going under surfaces, we're going to go under 3D assets. And you can get a sense of all the different objects, all the different assets that are available to download into our world. And all these are free from the Megascans library. But in our case, we're gonna go into nature. And then under nature, we're going to go to rock. It's really a boulder, but I suppose boulders are classified as rocks, right? And if we scroll way down here, we're looking for this Nordic boulder. I've also got a link in the description below to a spreadsheet where we're tracking all of our assets that we're using in this role-playing game that we're building. So feel free to reference that spreadsheet. And that spreadsheet just has the asset ID. And so if you paste in the asset ID like this, that's gonna bring you directly to that asset. And then that allows you to download it directly. But really quick, before we download it, I wanna go over a couple of things here. So one question that comes up a lot is, how large is that asset that we're downloading? If we can get a sense of its physical size in the game world by seeing this diagram here, so that it's a little person and a big rock in this case. And then also, we've got our quality settings. And this is particularly important because if we're making a game for a PC or console where we wanna use the highest quality assets, we should always make sure to download truly static meshes at nanite quality. And I say truly static because in the case of foliage, in the case of actual plants that are gonna move a little bit, because they use something called world position offset that allows them to kind of blow in the wind, they can't use the nanite functionality that's available for truly static meshes. So in the case of foliage, I'm gonna download those starting in our next episode at high quality. And you'll see why that is. 
But in the case of rocks, in the case of truly static, unmoving meshes, make sure to download those at Nanite quality if you're making a PC or console game. And then once you download that, and meshes are gonna take a little bit longer because they're high detail, then you can add it to our game world here. And you'll see a new content browser window pop up just like last episode. So I'm gonna close out of this and I'm gonna close out of bridge. So the first thing let's do is let's actually drag in that asset. And let me talk about what's going on here. So we'll go to our mega scans, we'll go to our 3D assets. This is a new folder that we should now have when we start bringing in those 3D assets. We got our Nordic Boulder. Select that, we can just click it and drag it in. And there it is. And as you've seen in the intro, this is our problem, right? So the moss looks similar to our landscape, but not exactly identical. And that's what we're gonna set up using a combination of updates to our landscape material, as well as the material that this boulder is using. And you can apply this to basically any Megascans material, and it's very easy, and we'll have that done by the end of the episode. And these updates that we're gonna make over the course of this episode, you can make these then to every single Megascans asset. And in fact, it's gonna be on automatically. So the very first thing we need to do is we need to enable virtual texture support. So to do that, we go up to settings in the top right corner, and then under project settings, if you search for virtual texture, and then you check this checkbox, enable virtual texture support. And you will need to restart the engine when you do that. And it might take a little while to restart because the first time you do this, it has to recompile shaders. So to talk a little bit more in detail about what we're doing, if you go back to our landscape material that we made last episode, so content, and we go to our MS presets, garden landscape material, and not the function, but the actual material, so we talked about last episode having different texture samples, one that stores our normal map, which is kind of the height data for shading of our actual base color. And so with the virtual textures, it's going to work very similar to that. And we basically need to set up two of them, one for the height data. So basically we need to tell every mesh that comes into the world, how high is the landscape? What's the height of the landscape at the point where the mesh is being placed on the world? And that's gonna determine how it actually blends with the landscape at that point. And then of course, we need a virtual base color texture because basically we're telling the mesh, okay, what color is this landscape at this location? And feed that color to our mesh that we're putting on that landscape. So let's go back, let's close this and we'll go to our content drawer. Go to Megascans, we're gonna create a new folder. If you right click and you select new folder, I'm gonna call this virtual, not all caps, virtual underscore textures. And we're gonna give it a new color to differentiate it from the other folders. So if you right click, go to set color, new color, and maybe let's make it, oh, let's give it a lavender. How about that? We'll go into that and we have to create two virtual textures. So to do that, we right click, and if you go under textures, so once you enable that in settings, so under textures, you should see a option for runtime virtual texture. So the first one we're gonna call VT height data. And this is gonna store, it's basically the normal map for our entire landscape. It's gonna store where every part of our landscape is on that Z axis at any given point in space. And we're gonna do that again for a second one. So we go to our textures, runtime virtual textures, and this is gonna be VT material data. All right, so let's go into our VT height data first, double click on that. And the very first thing I want you to do is for the size of the virtual texture in tiles, I want you to change this from eight to 12, and that's gonna up it to 4096. And what this is doing is this is setting the resolution of the virtual texture to be a 4K resolution. And if you remember when we downloaded our landscape materials, we also downloaded those at high quality, which is a 4K texture. And we want these two things to match. And the reason is that if this is a lower quality, if this is a lower resolution, then it's gonna look kind of grainy. It's not gonna blend well with our landscape. It's not gonna have the effect that we're looking for. And then the next thing I want you to do is under this virtual texture content, if you select that as world height, because for our world height, this is what's gonna pass in the data to our height data. And I'm gonna go right back to our content drawer, go into the material data now. We're gonna do the same thing. So I'm just gonna up this to 12, but this one, so this is not the height data, right? So this is everything else, base color, normal, roughness, specular, that's fine. We're keeping that as is. So the next thing we have to do is we have to create something in our actual level, in our world, called runtime virtual texture volume. And what this is going to do is it's gonna tell our world 
what part of the world do we want virtual textures to be active? And so to do that, we go under the green plus sign. And if I go under volumes, there is now an option for at the very bottom runtime virtual texture volume. And that's going to come into our world outliner on the right hand side there. So the first thing we need to do is we need to tell our runtime virtual texture volume what virtual texture this is going to apply to. So I'm going to select our VT height data for this first one. And the next thing we need to do is we need to tell it what part of our landscape it applies to, what part of our world. And in our case, I want it to apply to the entirety of our world. I had to play with this a little bit to get the settings right. But if you come down to scale and you select something like 52,000, 52,000, 1,000, if I look back, so then I can see it in our world there, but we need to center it. So I'm just going to change its location to be negative 26,000. So negative in the halfway point of that scale. And that's going to encompass basically the entirety of our landscape and then negative 500 for half of our scale there. And you'll see it surrounding our entire world now. And now I need to duplicate our runtime virtual texture volume to assign the rest of the data. And so I can just have that selected and say control C copy control V paste. And that'll be our second one. And you'll notice that it automatically keeps our transform that we selected. And all I need to do is I need to select our material data. And so now we need to tell each material what we want the runtime virtual textures to actually do. And there's really two types of materials involved here. There's our landscape material, and then there's our actual material on our meshes. Because what we want from our landscape material is we want that material to basically send out the data of whatever our landscape looks like at that particular point in, in space. And for our meshes, we want to be able to receive that data. So for example, for this mesh here, we want to be able to receive our landscape data at that point and then apply it up to a certain level, like up to the level of the moss here. And so let's start with our landscape first. So if I select any place on our landscape, and if I come down to our landscape material here, double click to go into that. So in our landscape material, we're not touching any of this existing setup. That's fine. That's all generating appropriately. But it also needs to communicate out what's going on. So we need to drag out an additional pin here. And we're going to break material attributes because we have to communicate what's going on here into our virtual material. And now we have to hook this up to a runtime virtual texture output node, runtime virtual texture output. And then we have to hook up all the stuff we need, the base color to the base color, specular to the specular, roughness to the roughness, and normal to the normal. Now we also have to tell it the world height of our landscape. And so what we're going to do for that is if we search for our world position, always comes in as absolute world position, but we search for world position. And remember how we just got the third channel, the Z, really the, the B here. So we're going to do a mask, but it's actually a component mask. And we can unselect the R and the G and just select the B. And we can hook that up to our world height here. Now I can save our landscape material. So now that we set up our landscape material to send out the virtual height map data, now we need to come back into our world and set up our landscape to receive that data. So if you go into your world outliner and you go under landscape and select your very top one and make sure you hold shift, select the very bottom one so you get your entire landscape. And then we need to scroll down here until we get to a portion of this that's virtual textures. And we need to select the plus sign twice here because we're going to draw in two virtual textures. And the first one is going to be our VT height data. And the second is going to be our VT material data. And when you do that, you'll actually see the textures generate according to how that landscape looks. So you'll see our lake in the middle, our, our four rivers that are coming into that. And then also our paint data, our base color for the material data below. All right, now that we've set up our landscape, now we have to do the setup on the material that this boulder is using, but also any other material that we'd want to use, right? Luckily, Megascans comes with just a few key materials that we need to update, because if we go back to content, it's really this MS presets folder. And with all the assets that I plan on using next episode to decorate our Earth quadrant, they really only use two of the materials listed here. So they use the default material and this default fuzz material. I think the fuzz is like moss growing on a rock or something like that. So those are the only two of this list that we're going to have to update with this trick. But by the end of this episode, you're going to know how to update any of them that you need. So let's go into our MMS default material. But before we start modifying MMS default material, how did I know that this was the material that our boulder here is using? 
Well, if I select our boulder in the world and I select its child material here, I could see its parent down here, MMS default material. And the nice thing about this is by just updating the parent material, if we have other assets come in the future that have different child materials, if they all share the same parent, then all we need to do if we want to turn runtime virtual textures off is we just change it on the child and we don't even have to modify that parent material. So all the setup that we have here, it's going to apply to every single other asset we bring in if we want it to. But it just occurred to me before we modify this, it's probably a good idea that we back up that material. So let's right click on it and let's duplicate. And I'm just gonna call it backup at the end. And that way, just in case we mess this up, we always have that backup to refer to. So let's set up this MS default material to receive our virtual texture input. So I'm gonna move this material node out a little bit and I'm gonna right click and we're gonna do a blend material attributes node. And then I'm gonna right click and I'm gonna search for virtual texture sample parameter. And this is what's actually going to receive the virtual texture data. And I'm gonna name this VT landscape height underscores in between. Move this over here. So now we need to get the world position of our mesh that we're bringing into the world. We've done this many times before. So if we right click, search for world position, we drag off a pin, component mask, we're just gonna get our Z value, which is our third channel, our B here. And then we're dragging off a pin of this mask and we're gonna subtract. And what we're subtracting from is, I'm just gonna rearrange these a little bit, is the world height from our landscape. And we need to set this up so that if the object is scaled up or scaled down, it's still gonna act appropriately in the world. So if we right click and we search for object bounds, and again, for this, we're just gonna get the height. So let's do a component mask. Again, just select the B value. And then from the subtract, we're gonna do an addition. You could just type plus sign to get an add node. Connect that up. Now we need to set a threshold for when the blending starts and when it stops. So we're gonna drag off from this mask and we need a multiply. You could just type an asterisk to get the multiply. And I'm gonna move this down below. And then we need to hook up our multiply node to a scalar parameter. So if I hold S and click, get our scalar parameter, and I'm gonna call this our virtual blend height. And I'll hook that up. I'm gonna set a default value of 1.1 for that. So now I need to control the sharpness of it, very similar to our height layer that we did last episode. So if I drag off add and I do a subtract, just do a minus sign, that'll do it. We'll hook up this multiply. And then from the subtract, we're gonna do a divide and that's gonna determine the sharpness of this blend. And if I hold S and enter, so we're gonna call this scalar parameter virtual blend sharpness. And this I'm gonna give a default value of 50. Almost done with this piece. So drag off from our divide. We're gonna do a saturate node. Now we're gonna reposition everything a little bit. So we're gonna drag all this over a little bit we're gonna move our blend material attributes and our default material out. We're gonna hook all of this up to our alpha. Let's actually make even more space here. So I wanna separate the things that we know are the standard from the things that are new here. There we go, move these in. And we can also do a comment on all this. So let's highlight all of it and hold C on the keyboard and that's gonna comment it. And let's call this blend based on landscape height and save our material. Now we've got to hook up our original material. So this node's from MF object adjustments and that's gonna be the B. And then from blend material attributes, we can hook that up to the default material. And what are we blending with? Well, we're blending with our landscape, right? So this has to be what gets our landscape. But before that, we see we got an error under VT landscape height. So if you select that node, come down to virtual texture, you just choose the VT height data here, that's gonna correct that. We could save our material. So now let's set up our landscape blending. If you right click and search for runtime virtual texture sample parameter, and we're gonna name this VT material landscape. So this is going to be the reference to our landscape material. But we can't blend our base color, specular roughness, et cetera, into here because we need an actual in-between for our material attributes. So I can right click and do make material attributes and I can connect these all up, base color, specular, roughness, 
normal. And I can hook up our make material attributes. And to fix this error, I just select the VT material landscape. And now I can choose our landscape material data. And now I'm just going to comment this highlight C blends from landscape, save our material. All right, now we're at the point where we could start testing this. So let's save and let's minimize this. And I'm going to adjust my camera speed to be a little bit slower. And let's drag around our boulder and whoa, look at that. We've got the material changing in real time as we drag it around. Looking down at it looks pretty good. But then the problem is when I'm looking out, whoa, the coloring is is totally off. And this is that Fresnel problem that I was talking about at the start of the episode. So I, to be honest, it took me like half an hour just to troubleshoot this one issue on my end. Um, I played around with camera settings, all sorts of stuff. And at some point I might start streaming and in which case you'll see me fumbling around like crazy. Uh, but the short answer is the problem is in our landscape material. There's this Fresnel effect and Fresnel, what it basically means is how much light reflects off a surface based on the angle you're looking at the thing. So based on the angle of our landscape, it's basically much brighter. And then if I look at it from below, then it's basically the same color as our rock here. But it, that's a problem if it's reflecting differently than any static meshes that we bring into the world. So we really got to fix that. So let's go into our landscape material. And I think I still have it open here. And I'll show you where this is coming from. So if you go back into our material function that we created last episode, it's coming from, if you zoom over to this Fresnel, I guess it's French, I don't know. It's coming from all this, that's what's causing it. And so what I figured out is if you just wanna keep this just for reference, it doesn't really hurt to have it there. But if you hook up the multiply node here in our landscape function directly to the base color and you save that, this is gonna take a few seconds to compile shaders, but let's take a look, see if that fixes the coloring. Yeah, and so now the coloring of our landscape, it's actually a lot closer matching to the static meshes. But there's still an issue here because if I zoom in close, I can see it. So there's certain parts of our mesh where it goes, it basically goes vertical. So like if I zoom in very close, you see this, this is called texture stretching. And the reason is that it's, it's not looking at the texture in a three dimensional way. It's just reading it across. And so when it's straight up, it just stretches it in those locations. And we have a way of eliminating that. So let's take care of that issue now. So if you go back into our MS default material here, and if you come down underneath our blend based on landscape height, so if you right click and search for vertex normal, this node, and again, we gotta do a component mask. We're just gonna get the Z value. And we're gonna multiply this. So I can just type in that asterisk after I right click. And we're gonna multiply it by a scalar parameter. So we can hold S, click, and we're gonna call this vertical contrast. And I'm gonna set this by default to one, connect that up to the multiply. And this is gonna control how much or how little the virtual texture is used for those vertical parts of the mesh. And now we're gonna drag off from multiply and do a saturate. And now we're gonna drag off from the saturate node, do a multiply, but it actually needs to be connected to the B. So I can hold Alt, disconnect that one. And then we need to connect the saturate up to a multiply, but we basically need to invert the effect. And so what Unreal Sensei shows is to invert something, you just do a one minus and hook this up. And I don't really understand the math all that well here, but if anyone understands this math, please feel free to post it in the comments below. And we got to do another invert from the multiply. So I'm going to do one minus enter, and then I'm going to hook that up to the alpha. You should see that update here. And then let's take a look. So now, if I move this around, it's still updating, but we don't have that crazy texture stretching. There's a little bit going on here, but the effect is much reduced. And if anyone has ideas for making this even better, by all means, please post them in the comments below. All right, so now that we got this working on one material, how do we make it so that it's easily accessible and usable by any material? And so for that, we're gonna use the same trick we did last episode, which is we're gonna make a material function. So let's go back into our MS default material. And so basically all of this is gonna be a single material function. So what I'm gonna do is highlight it 
I'm going to right click and we're going to copy and then I'm going to collapse this, go back to our content drawer and under functions under our MS default material, we're going to create a new one. So we right click, select material, material function, and I'm going to call this MF virtual texture landscape height blend. That's a, it's a mouthful and double click to go into that. And now we could paste everything in and we can hook up our material attributes to our output. But again, we need an input for a function. This is what we did last episode, much the same way. So how do we have an input for our function? And the input is this B node. Well, we just right click and we do a function input. And for this function input, it's going to be a function input material attributes. And this is going to connect up to what we're blending. This is our main material that's going to be blended into our landscape material. So we could save this. And now let's go back to our default material. This is the dangerous part. Is it going to work? So we can select all of this delete. How do we call our function? So we can right click material function call. We'll blend this in and then we can move this all over, connect it up and then I noticed that it's probably not going to work. Oh, it's actually working. There we go. So if this doesn't work, it didn't work for me the first time. Restart Unreal Engine, try it out again. I think it'll then work. So why did we make that material function? Well, we made it so that we could take this single material function and we could apply it to any Megascans material. Like you heard me say at the beginning of this episode, we want to apply it to our default fuzz material because that's going to be what a lot of the rocks, a lot of the boulders use that we're going to start decorating our landscape in the next episode. So if you select that, go into that default fuzz material here. So what I notice is we can't use that material function after this material function for fuzz. It has to be applied before because I guess the fuzz goes on top. That makes sense. Yeah, the fuzz is on top. So we're going to right click. We're going to do a material function call and I'm going to search for our virtual MF virtual texture landscape height blend. Got all that. And then we're going to connect up our map adjustments. That's going to be our input. And then this is going to connect to our MA and then our fuzz. That's just material uh, fuzz that we're not touching. So we're not adjusting our fuzz. All right, so let's go back to our landscape and everything seems to be working in order as I drag it around. Let's also try it on some other areas, right? So if I go to our grass material, is it working properly? Yeah, everything seems to be in order there. Dragging around the Christmas tree and back in our even if I put it under water, it seems to be looking working. Look at that. Now, let's say that I want it to be fully covered even when it's at this level. So right now I have to put it kind of far down for it to be fully covered by our river material. But let's say I want to change that. So to do that, I could go into our child material here. And then I just need to adjust the parameters that we set up earlier. So these parameters, vertical contrast, virtual blend height, virtual blend sharpness, those are coming from if I go into our material function, these parameters that we set up here, virtual blend height, virtual blend sharpness, vertical contrast. So let's go back to that material. And if I select one of those, so let's say our virtual blend sharpness, I'm going to choose 100 for that. And I'm going to make the height a little bit taller. So maybe like a one point in Let's actually do this while we're looking at it so you can see how that looks. So I'm going to make this be 1.2, let's say. Yeah, so you see it get a little bit darker. If I set it to a higher number here, it gets a little darker. So what I found is just about here, we got the ideal settings. Uh, so we can actually increase this to maybe 10 and that gets very dark then. So that's the reason some green was still showing through is because some of those green areas were vertical. And if I increase this number, that's increasing the vertical effect. So you get the idea. And so that's where having the child material can be really useful on an individual mesh. And you could have this mesh multiple times in multiple locations, and you could just duplicate the child material and set it to be a different child material for each of the meshes. And then that way these settings could be adjusted for each individual mesh that you place in the world. Now let's set it back to our defaults. And let's place that back into our earth quadrant. So I'll move it up not under the ground. Let's move it up a little bit. Yeah, that looks just about good. And then we'll go ahead and play here. 
and get up nice and close so we can check it out and yeah look at that so the moss i'm gonna get real close zoom in and the moss kind of feeds right into the rock there and up close i can see that nanite level quality and uh what um i guess i can go outside the rock so this is due to something called collision or really the lack thereof on our rock asset here and we're going to get into collision a lot in our future episodes but i figure at least now we can give you a quick crash course so let's go into the actual static mesh so if you select it in the world and you double click that's going to open up our static mesh editor here and there's a few things that we can do in here right off the bat i'm going to zoom out and if you go under collision here we can add a simplified collision usually i choose this 26 dop which is the more most detailed simplified collision but the problem with simplified collision is that it really isn't that accurate so i'll just save that and let's go ahead and play again and I'll show you what that looks like. I'm just gonna move my player start closer to the boulder. So the problem with simple collision is that it doesn't always reflect what the actual dimensions of an actor are. So this, this rock in our world, clearly you can see that my player is hitting it and I can't go into it anymore, but I'm nowhere near the actual rock. And if I want my character to be able to jump on the rock, to be able to climb up on the rock, to be able to touch the rock, this isn't gonna work. So let me show you what I do instead for those more complex actors. So let's come back into our asset here. And what I can do is I can get rid of that collision, that simplified mesh collision. And on the right hand side in the details panel, there's a setting down here under collision complexity. Instead of project default, I can say use complex collision as simple. And what this does is it uses the actual geometry, the physical mesh, the structure of that mesh to reflect what the collision is in the world. And it's more performance intensive, but it's worth it for these larger assets where you really want them to be representative of where they physically are in the world. So then we can make our character jump up on it and have trouble climbing such a steep slope. Maybe we'll come up on the other side. Come on, come on, you can make it. Come on, come on, yeah. So guys, finally, we are ready in earnest next episode to start decorating our landscape. And we've been waiting for this for a while. There's a few little things that we still need to do. So when we start bringing in these assets, you're gonna, you might see an error that says texture streaming is over budget. I'll show you how to fix that next episode. Uh, but for all intents and purposes, we are now ready to start decorating. And this is going to pivot a little bit. And next episode is really going to be about art, even though I have no formal art training to speak of. So that'll be interesting. Uh, so I hope you stick with me.